welcome to the most excellent 80s movies podcast. It's the podcast where a filmmaker and a comedian smash and bang and saxophone their way through the 80s movies we think we know or might have missed. Today we're talking about a movie where two men enter and one man leaves. It's of course Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, a movie selection from 1985. I'm Chrissy Lins, director of the Neighborhood Comedy Theater in downtown Mesa, Arizona. And I'm Nathan Blackwell, a uh, Phoenix-based Phoenix uh, filmmaker from 1976. <laughs> <laughs> award-winning, award-winning. And with us today, we are so happy to have our special guest, Drea Magwood, a filmmaker and content creator. Uh, welcome. Hello. <laughs> So happy to have you here to talk about Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome. Um, uh, let's just go around the table. Have you seen this movie before, Nathan? Uh, y- yes, but I feel like I've only seen it like once all the way through. Like it, it's it's a little nuts. Like this is this is up my alley, but this is one of those um, one of those things when when it came out like i didn't really have access to it and then mm-hmm. it just wasn't one of those those like go to movies on repeat when we did get like home video yeah um but it's it's a pretty sassy sassy little number i've never seen it before this was my first time i was very pleasantly surprised what about you andrea have you seen it a lot i have never seen this movie before yesterday Okay. <laughs> Go on. Yes. Oh, I've never yeah. seen the first one before yesterday. No, really? Mm-hmm. I've seen oh, Mad Max Fury Road, but that's because, you know, all the big stars was in it. I still had never seen it, though. Hmm. Uh, it's pretty good, though. I liked it. Do you li- did you like it? What was your, uh, what's your first hot take? It was interesting. <laughs> yeah. It was very interesting. It's interesting it is in spades so um, so what did you so we this this um what did you think of road warrior which is the we just covered on our previous episode what what were your thoughts on on road warrior that's the second one right yeah yeah, yeah. oh and i haven't even seen that one because i didn't realize there was a two i'm like oh i'm like what happened between one and three i was like so, something happened yeah. <laughs> well, uh, what was the first? Did you see Mad Max and the nineteen seventy nine version? That's what oh I my saw. gosh! Okay, that one's like long and boring and really sets the seed. Mad Max Two is like a, uh, it's almost like Mad Max Four. It's like a start to finish car chase. Mm-hmm. Okay, With- I guess I should have watched that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of explosions and stuff. Um, so this movie picks up in the desert in the wastelands of Australia where uh, Max has traded in his famous uh, interceptor, which got blown up, and his Mack truck, which got blown up, for a herd of camels and a little wagon. (laughs) And a monkey. And a monkey. He's got a little monkey companion. I mean, this little monkey was really loyal to him, and I wanted to see the story of how he got the monkey. It's kind of like in Back to the Future, you know, where you never know how Doc and Marty got together. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. the story of Mad Max and this monkey. But he gets his gear and the whole thing stolen by a uh, the gyro captain in a plane and his little son, <laughs> <laughs> who are a sky-thieving team. <laughs> What did you guys think of the sky thieving team? The gyro uh, pilot was from Road Warrior, which we just saw. Um, and so it was neat to bring him back. The question is, like, how much time has passed since then that he's um, now produced offspring or maybe adopted the kid? I don't think he's the feral boy. No. Who the, the, uh, the pilot, Bruce Spence, uh, saved. You know, because they're just too similar in age and they're, they're, yeah, it's, it's a little more transformative. He also has like super duper long hair. Mm hmm. Max does. Yeah, like yeah. Max, yeah. 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 I, I think there's definitely been uh, a lot of time. I, I think it was like five years that there's five years between the, t- the Road Warrior and this movie. Yeah. Question, I question mark? That. No, period. Exclamation point. I think I say that's a fact. Okay. Um, yeah, no, it was great to see them again, and it was great that it was more than than a cameo 
Um, it's you know, it's like with with Mad Max, the uh, the thing you realize after seeing, um, and then I don't know like the f- for like on the first one, um, but from Road Warrior and on, it's really kind of like the story is actually told by the people who survived it, not Max. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's by the the kids. Uh, you know, at the end of this, it's the um the uh the feral boy from road warrior it's more like like the the brides and furiosa from you know fury road he is kind of like someone who enters into other people's stories as like the yeah. man with no name for sure um what did you think of his whole little entourage of camels getting uh nicked right at the top drea i was like I was. Tr- I'm trying to get past the believe the possibility of somebody dropping from a plane, not dying, yeah. hit the ground, and then purposely landing on this wagon. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> so yeah. I know it's a kind of fantasy, but I couldn't get past that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would work as a thieving, uh-huh. uh, thieving yeah. plane. If you drop out of the sky in this desert wasteland, it's it's almost like you can have my camels. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you can figure out a way to get that to work, then you've got a wonderful little niche, you know. <laughs> yeah, and they they do seem to have uh, a wonderful little life there. But uh, so Max is forced to go to the barter town, and he has nothing to barter with except his own deadly skills, uh, which leads me to my thesis statement of this episode, which is that this movie is a comedy. <laughs> He takes out so many guns when they're like, leave your weapons here. Yeah. He takes out a comical amount of guns. And you've seen that in other movies. And I feel like the first time I saw it was in this movie. You know, like it's kind of like paid homage or other people have (laughs) kind of like, you know, ripped it off or whatever. Um, Lovingly ripped it off. Um, But yeah, yeah. It's just like him just endlessly putting down guns and, and, and weapons and things like that. That was one of those scenes that I definitely remember that kind of entered the 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 pop culture from this Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and one of many comedic moments where you're just like this is almost a slapstick yeah well i you know now you know uh, refreshing myself on road warrior seeing thunderdome and then and having seen fury road so many times now um you realize that there's a lot of common ingredients and it's um, with with all the Mad Max movies, there is a degree of slapstick to all of them. Yeah. In addition to like just this intense, bizarre, you know, behaviors of how people have um, survived in the wasteland. Right. Well, as filmmakers, though, I, how hard is it to like thread the needle between like this is an action movie. We're trying to appeal to an action audience. We want, you know, the dads to come and see this movie. But uh, there's there's silly comedy in here. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think it's a match made in heaven. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps this movie is not edgy enough. Mm hmm. Well, I, I I don't think George Miller cares. I think he has, a, a, you know, it's like we talk about there's like minimalism. I think we've talked about like maximalism with like everything everywhere all at once that you've like condensed like three movies into one. Like mm-hmm. George Miller fully supports maximalism. Like I, I Mad feel like maximalism. Come yes. on. You can't just leave oh. that there. Mad maximalism. <laughs> but I feel like he jam packs his movies with the things that delight him. And so it, it is the, the, the violence, the insanity, the bizarre people, and then the slapstick. And it's, it's, it's all in there. And it kind of feels like he's iterating on the same type of movie. Yeah. Um, speaking of the slapstick and the, or the weird and the delightful, he gets taken from his audition up to meet Auntie, who runs Barter Town, who is Tina Turner, who's hanging out with someone just playing, he's playing the world's last saxophone. <laughs> but Tina Turner has got to have her saxophone. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Andrea, what did you think of Tina Turner in this movie? I mean, she looked she looked great. And I was like, she oh, okay. Amazing. That costume, I heard it was like a hundred and something pounds of chains and stuff. Oh my gosh. Like, and you know, it was hot outside. I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't know if I could have done that. Yeah, I don't know if in a in a desert environment, if I would go chain mail on my on my top to bottom look. She runs Barter Town, but from her cute little mm-hmm. like um, balcony area, which is which has plenty of shade. Mm-hmm. Um, but how heavy did you say it was? A hundred pounds of chain? It was at least a hundred. I forgot the exact weight, but it was at least a hundred. Jeez, nice. Louise. Um, what, what were so? Uh, what were your initial thoughts of this installment before pl- pressing play on this one? Because I can I can share mine. Uh, which were like, I felt like this because like, you know, as soon as it starts with like the Tina Turner song, mm-hmm. it's like, Ooh, is this like the, the Hollywood watered down version of M- Mad Max? Like they mm-hmm. finally got like American funding. They've <laughs> always been like, you know, just, you know, like a scrappy Australian movie making cre- you know, like, and now they're, they're, they're putting, it's like, it's, it opens with like a pop song it's like my worry is that this this would have been this was going to be like a watered down version of of a Mad Max movie, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that quickly dispelled, you know, that it, 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 as soon as it starts, you immediately know that it, it's totally a Mad Max movie because there's there's so much violence. Well, just not only that, but just like again, like the bizarre, like the idiosyncratic characters and and the the story, you know, like the uh, George Miller is is such a good screenwriter. Um, mm-hmm. Just the way that he introduces the world and the characters and the situations, and he really puts everyone on their back foot, and especially in this one, like we are lured into sympathy with Tina Turner's character pretty soon, you know, like first we think that she's maybe the antagonist and then we're kind of lured into her side. She kind of represents the person who's taking care of the people and really wants to do the best. Um, And then eventually, you know, maybe like 20 minutes in it's flipped around again and she really kind of is revealed as the villain. And there's a lot of, a lot of times in this movie to where it's kind of moving where you think it's going to go. And then it, you know, it it almost kind of like sets up towards like a, 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 like a trope or cliche. And then it just veers hard to the other side. Hard. It takes, this movie takes many hard lefts. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Into, into Lord of the flies territory (laughs) at some points. Um, Yeah. I know. I didn't know anything about this movie going in, except for that. There was a Thunderdome. Mm-hmm. And then Tina Turner was in it. Pretty much, that's all I knew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When uh, when these kids show up, I'm like, "What is happening?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just having seen Road Warrior so many times and and Fury Road so many times, this was really, for whatever reason, the one that I didn't revisit. And I guess I always thought of it as kind of like the the Hollywood version. Like this is the first time that when they got like U S funding, it's like, it's like, so we're, (laughs) we've got a lot of new American accents in in the Mm -hmm. Australian. It's like, there was there, Oh, this must've been from the consulate or, or some, some part of like Sydney or whatever. Well, here's my question to you. So if you are a villain in a post-apocalyptic wasteland barter town, you really have to set yourself apart with your look. Right, we've got Iron Bar, who's got another head that sort of floats on an iron bar above his head. Um, you know, everybody's got their own look. So, as a makeup influencer, Drea, what uh, what kind of looks would you recommend people go for in this post-apocalyptic world to really stand out and shine? Everybody was just dirty. I, yeah. I don't know. Just you stand out if you were clean, but then they'd be like, "Where'd you get the water?" Yeah. So, uh, and I, how dare you wash yourself with it? <laughs> exactly. I was like, I don't know why they're so dirty. I'm like, is this what's going to happen? Am I going to be this dirty? I'm like, I can't. <laughs> yeah. That's what I don't want is, and, and the, so a big part of this movie deals with pig shit too. So, <laughs> got, literally, yeah. Barter town on top. 
But the reason that they have power and gas and energy is because there's a whole underworld full of pigs mm -hmm. whose, whose shit is being used to turn into methane. And the person in charge of that is actually two people, Master and Blaster, a big scary guy, and the little uh, person who rides on his back. Yes. So that's I, an iconic character, Master Blaster. Who's hanging out in the underworld with the with the pig shit. And so uh, we learn that there's this like these little embargoes that keep going on because Master Blaster thinks he runs Barter Town and Auntie, who's Tina Turner, wants to run Barter Town. So that's where Mad Max comes in. They go through all these machinations to get them into the Thunderdome. Mm -hmm. uh, where two men enter, one man leave, and it's really a lot bouncier than you think it's going to be right at first. <laughs> Can we talk about like that dome announcer? He is fantastic. Yes, his outfit, outfit was wonderful. He was so great. They have a little game show host, so that's what my mm -hmm. that's the job I'm going to try and get in this mm -hmm. post-apocalyptic world. Mm -hmm. He's like the reader of the laws, and he uh, he sort of is the game show host of the Thunderdome. Mm -hmm. But what about how Tina Turner flies down in a little cage? Uh -huh. It's good to be the that's boss. pretty. That's pretty yeah. epic as well. No, mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah, I, I, de I get the sense like she was in charge. Like she helped found Barter Town, and then because of the power dynamic of Master Blaster, basically Master is the scientist. You know, mm -hmm. he's the one behind all the technology that allows them to harness the methane. Um, and and he is pull he and he is using that leverage to the nth degree. Like he is yeah. being, uh, he is basically usurping control of Barter Town from her in a public fashion. Um, so he's not some nice dude. In fact, we think he's going to be the villain. Um, plus, yeah. she's she's auntie, and she and, and then Tina Turner does a great job of kind of, you know, of of having this like compassion for the people, you know, like like the the kind of everyone is nuts except for her. Like she is right. even even headed, you know. Yeah, um, nothing and then, is nothing about her except those legs and those shoulder pads. Right, she doesn't have like a weird grammatical hang-ups like everyone else does, you know. Um, Master Blaster wants the power, and he's there to kind of take it over. And so it's, it, you know, it's really these two factions vying against each other for barter town and we're only like 10 minutes into the movie and we're kind of yeah. hooked at this point now yeah so mad max's job is to kill blaster mm -hmm. in the thunderdome which is how they settle every dispute that's the law of barter town if you have a fight over anything you go into the thunderdome you get strapped up to two rubber bands and you got to jump all around this spiky <laughs> person covered dome arena grabbing whatever weapons you can uh, to try and kill the other guy. And I mean, there must have been a lot of little petty disputes that really ended badly. But uh, we got Max in here with Blaster. He's getting his ass handed to him. But lo and behold, he has a secret weapon. It's, it's like Chekhov's whistle. Yeah, it's a whistle yeah. that he finds. He, if he, he found out that Blaster is really um, vulnerable to... To like high pitched sounds. Yeah. So he's got this magical whistle. He's about to kill Blaster. And then lo and behold, Blaster is a person with Down syndrome, just a giant, mm -hmm. uh, intellectually disabled uh, young man. And so Max won't kill him. Don't worry, Auntie will. <laughs> yeah. And but that's all what, of a sudden. That's when we have the villain turn. So you keep saying the villain turn. I was never really sympathetic with her in the beginning. I just wanted to see what is she going to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you really can't. You shouldn't really trust a lot of people in the wasteland. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a good rule of thumb. That was my mistake. I maybe trust too easily. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, she, she did try and kill him within thirty seconds of him yeah. being in her little several time. times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was yeah. an audition. You know, who knows? Uh -huh. Yeah, there you go. It's really hard to get a gig in Barter Town. I guess the saxophone really just like, you know, dropped my defenses. <laughs>
Well, that'll get me too. That'll get me too if I'm like, what? You have the world. Like, it's been so long since I heard music. All I have is this terrible whistle. <laughs> I'd be on your side immediately. Um, but so the crowd almost turns on Tina Turner too, because they're like, no, two men enter, one man leaves. You got to let Max go. Right. Like, he may not have killed Blaster, but he, two men entered. What We chanted it. The whole setup for Barter Town is that there there are rules, and yeah. that's that's the thing that she reminds everyone. I created order from chaos, and By so making rules that are catchy and chantable. Two men enter, <laughs> one man leaves. Bust a deal, face the wheel. Like that's how mm -hmm. you you get power in the wasteland is by making catchy laws that rhyme. It, it, and and all their laws are also kind of a form of entertainment too, of public right. entertainment. You know, so so he uh, he has to face this wheel, which says that he's sent to be sent to the gulag, which basically means that he's just like sent out into the desert to die. Mm -hmm. Basically, but instead of dying, he finds a herd of children. Yeah. And so this is really where. It kind of becomes another movie, you know? Oh, wait. Before we get to the children, Nathan, there's uh -huh. a quicksand moment. Oh. I just wanted to acknowledge for you that uh -huh. quicksand happens in this movie. Because I know you love a quicksand moment. You know what? We As kids, we thought it was going to be a bigger problem as adults. <laughs> With all the quicksand we saw in the movies, it just became like, okay, uh, it's just one of the things that adults have to deal with. Quicksand nope, here, much. there, and everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> it is an, a sad, sinking horse moment too. So, another yeah. horse. Yes. So, so they they exile him and they put him on the back of a horse. Like, was that a criminal horse too? I feel like they wouldn't waste <laughs> just any horse. Yeah, that's a resource. I feel like that was that horse was a real asshole. You know, for them to do yeah, that. Please give him one of his own camels. Yeah. They. Yeah, I, I yeah, I mean, I, maybe they're sick of horses at this point. They're like enough. We, we got we're we got we're drowning in pigs. We're just up to our necks in horses. <laughs> we gotta. If you go to the gulag, you you send a horse to its doom as well. So meanwhile, while Max is out wandering the desert, stumbling into the Lord of the Flies. Uh, Master Blaster, or Master, who's the only half of the Master Blaster who's left, won't help them, like, continue to run Barter Town. He's being very stubborn. He's very sad. Mm -hmm. Luckily, this, like, young girl finds Max and drags him back to this little, like, oasis mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there's, like, dozens of young kids. Like, really young kids. Yeah, and, and this is another one of those, like, great moments to where... You know, you see a, a lot in all the different Mad Max movies that there's these pockets of people and how and, and of, of, you know, like either like a couple dozen or a hundred or whatever. And you see over and over like how these people redefine civil, their civilization, you know, mm -hmm. um, you've you know, you've got like the the raiders the like the uh from the from road warrior and then you've got like all these kind of like uh the people who are ho hoarding the oil and they're kind of a democracy but they're always fighting you know it's a bunch of adults and then now you see barter town and you see these kids you know um and it it's really interesting to see how these pockets of people kind of like start their own little society like these kids all have their own made up words and their own crazy grammar. There's no adults telling them to do anything. And they they tell the story uh, of how they came to be there in a plane crash where all the adults left them to go and seek help and never came back. Mm -hmm. So when Max shows up and he's an adult, they're like, oh, well, he must be the captain who left us come back to help us out of here. Mm -hmm. And of course, Max has to do that thing that he does where he's like, no, I'm <laughs> not your helper captain. I'm not going to help you at all. Just leave me alone and let me eat all your squirrels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have a heart of gold. Leave me alone. Did you buy that at all? What did you think of the kids, Drea? 
a little creepy to me to be wake up surrounded by a bunch of children, dirty children. <laughs> um, that, that would upset yeah, me. They're very dirty. <laughs> uh-huh. But yeah, I totally understand. Yeah, I wouldn't help them either. <laughs> <laughs> like, where are your parents at? <laughs> yeah. And why are you all so dirty and gross when you've got a little lake you could take? Yeah, the water is right there. <laughs> Hop in and scrub it up, dub. Um, I really liked the scene where she has the big stick with like a sort of screen on the end mm-hmm. and she's taking them through mm-hmm. the events because you can tell that like this is their bedtime story every night. They do the membering mm-hmm. uh, and tell this tell the story. Um, and her job is really important because she gets to be the teller of the story. That's going to be your job, you guys, now that you're because you're filmmakers. So you got to s- get those jobs of holding the stick that tells the story. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Got to work on my type five. Yeah, for sure. Because you don't want that to drag. No, you're going to lose the little kid's attention. Yeah, I, f- I felt like this. This is where the movie again. And, you know, I had the the preconceptions of what this movie was going to be about. And I probably haven't seen this movie since like the nineties, you know, like 98 or something like that. Um, And this is one of those scenes that surprised me where the movie kind of takes like the the movie kind of takes like a, 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 an unexpected turn. And in in my mind, this kind of deepened the movie, you know, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. it, it, if all the time, you know, uh, Max is kind of good. You guys are assholes, but uh, I kind of believe you. All right, fine. He now he's actually put into a place to where he is kind of has to be kind of a you know a compassionate human with them, mm-hmm. like yeah. on on the surface. Even though he gives them some real tough love right away, like I, I a, a lesser movie, like you know they think he's the savior. He's there to take them to the, you know, to the promised land or whatever. And a lesser movie would like stretch it out for a couple of scenes. But he tells them straight up, I'm not this dude. Don't go out there. This is better than, you know, it better here than what you, that you can find out there. Like he gives them he gives them the full truth right up front. In fact, he punches her in the face after shooting at her several times. And then puts the kids in jail. The kids who want to leave, mm-hmm. who are fixing to leave, he puts the little, like, they, they make a little kid jail. And he's like, yeah, you stay in there. <laughs> I created the kid jail. That was me. <laughs> but they escape anyway. So the kid jail wasn't that. Um, <laughs> what was the first iteration? <laughs> yeah. It was Mark One of kid jail. Uh, the kids who want to try and make it out of their little oasis escaped and Max does decide he's going to go after them. He yeah. takes he takes two like water carrying kids and a little tiny boy. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite parts of this whole movie is when he's like the little the little tiny boy comes running after them like I'm going too and he's <laughs> like you're on your own and then the next scene he's riding on Max's back. <laughs> <laughs> mhm. Yeah, I I think this movie was supposed to be the final Mad Max movie. Uh, mm-hmm. It was definitely going to be Mel Gibson's last one. And so they wanted to end this one in a way that shows that he's kind of come a fuller circle, you know, in terms yeah. of, 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 um, cause he is, he's much more of an a-hole in road warrior. Yeah, you know? for sure. And he wants out much more than he does in this one. In this yeah. one, he's 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 had some time in the desert to soften up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but you know what? All Max, all Mad Max new movies truly need is some kind of ridiculous car chase. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. When Max catches up to the kids, they decide that what they're going to do is kidnap Master. And bring him back so he can like help them. Mm-hmm. Um, and he and then once he gets once they all get down into the they it, it's like Temple of Doom. They infiltrate the underworld, right? They like free all the slaves. It's, instead of freeing all the children, they're they're freeing one one master, <laughs> one master and one adult friend. Yes. Um, 
and they take a train out of there. Mm-hmm. They destroy all of Barter Town. Seventy <laughs> percent conservatively. Yeah. Conservatively, yeah. yeah. They, the, the problem is that the methane went off, and so there was a lot of explosions. So yeah. But well, Auntie, Auntie is made. immediately like, we'll rebuild. We're going to rebuild this, guys. It's fine. We're going to be okay. Don't you worry. That's that's when she really shines as a leader, I felt. And you and know, okay I with believe it. her. I believe her. I wouldn't have believed her. Mm. You, you wouldn't like, have? Did you I'm like, it just happens. So, you know, am I the only one who listened to this saxophone? It's literally, it just happens. She's like, when we build, I'm like, it just happened. You don't know the damage, the total damage. Well, let's you know look at everything first, then discuss. We have to check the next. foundations. Are, are exactly. the foundations good? We don't know. Exactly. We don't know. Maybe we don't rebuild. Maybe we just uh, move three move miles the, down the hill. We just move <laughs> the town to the other side of the hill. <laughs> yeah, but so while they're escaping in the train. The little kid in the plane tries to rob them again. <laughs> yeah, I found that very, very yeah, very yeah, the, yeah the, the gyrocopter or the the uh, yeah the, uh, the little, that little kid. Uh, I love him. He's my favorite <laughs> character in this movie. They uh, the, did you notice though that as soon as Master Blaster gets into this train, he dresses up like steampunk. He's like a little steampunk gentleman. I was like, where did he get the suit? I'm like, where did this come from? Three piece suit. Yeah. <laughs> Well, was it in well, the train the whole time? He goes like, ah, it's good. finally time for a special occasion. <laughs> so it's a, it's a car chase. It's hard to it's hard to talk about a car chase because it's, it's just yeah. it's it's boom slash mm-hmm. person stuck to the front of the train, person mm-hmm. stuck to the bottom of the train. They're climbing in the train. Master is getting tucked up under people's armpits and thrown around like a sack of flour. Because mm-hmm. um, everybody just wants Master because he's the only one who knows how to do anything. Yeah, mm-hmm. but um, it's 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 comical. It's like Looney Tunes. It's like there's a moment where the guy is hanging on to the train, and he's like jumping over the like the things that hang the mailbags, and he's like, "Whoa, whoa!" <laughs> like he's in a like he's in a Coyote and Roadrunner cartoon. Mm-hmm. It's silly, silly, silly. No, I'm the only one who thinks so. I think so. yeah. I don't. I don't agree. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> there were there were definitely silly moments, but I felt like it was an improvement from Road Warrior in some ways. Like I felt like I was more connected. Well, I don't know. Now that I think about it, I don't. I I don't know. I I don't necessarily want to rate them against each other, but I I, I felt like oh, it was. What you're gonna? Okay. We're all gonna. We're all gonna. Yeah, Andrea, because you didn't see it. <laughs> there were. I mean, there were definitely silly moments for sure. Mm-hmm. And, the, and so they all hop in all the children and max uh hop into the little plane because they uh they're like you gotta get us out of here and the little kid's like we're in deep shit dad mm-hmm. uh, i robbed the wrong train this time <laughs> uh, they can't take off because they're too heavy and there's not enough runway with all the cars coming through so max of course mm-hmm. volunteers to sacrifice himself and plow a hole through the line of cars so the plane can take off and take the little kids and master to uh, back to the Oasis to be uh, saved and get them all out of there somehow. Yeah, his, um, his heroic moment. This time and around. he gets caught. He gets totally busted by Auntie and she's just like, all right, you're 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 cool with me. No, no, no. That disappointed me so much. <laughs> I was like, what's the point of this chase? If you just can be like, okay, fine, you can go. Yeah, I, I would. It's yeah. It's it was. I felt like that was a weak moment. Like I could buy it with. Her. She sold it well. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, that was kind of like a. Uh, it that was a little kind of Deus Ex, you know. Of yeah, she can't kill him because mm-hmm. we at this point we love him. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, that was a tough part. That was a tough moment. It was just silly. It was part of the comedy of the whole thing. So the little kids and the gyro man go to Sydney uh, mm-hmm. to see the Tomorrow Morrow Land. It really is a wasteland, but with the master's help, they sort of turn on the lights. Mm-hmm. And that's our end, is that they turn on the lights, hoping that Max and other people like Max 
will find their way home. Yeah. So again, we kind of like kind of like how we ended the the Road Warrior. It, it's we realize that this story, this whole story, is being told by the 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 good survivors of the adventure. You know. Yeah. I but I believe that Barter Town did rebuild. I do too. I believe that Auntie finally got control of Barter Town. She made up more rules that rhyme, and then everyone was fine. I mean, honestly, with all, with some of these civilizations, like Barter Town, really isn't on like the. It's kind of in the middle, you know. I felt yeah. like there were a lot of pretty okay people there, mm-hmm. you know, like that announcer with his jacket. Yeah, he was great. <laughs> yeah, he's just trying to find enough entertainment gigs to get by. Yeah, which, absolutely. You know, can relate. So it's kind of a tough one because this movie really pushes a lot. It 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 checks a lot of boxes Mm -hmm. but I don't know that they're the boxes that necessarily add up to one big box of yes I'm not sure so out of on a scale of one saxophone to ten saxophones how many saxophones do you give Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome Uh, we'll start with Nathan and then we'll do Drea so I was, we're doing we just did Road Warrior and it and obviously this is the sequel we can't help but compare them you know if you would have told me before that I would have had a better time watching Thunderdome I would have been surprised because to me Road Warrior is a classic but I think we both kind of were I don't know a little a little let down by Road Warrior mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and I and 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 maybe it was just us. Maybe we're bad people. I suspected it for a while. That um, we get, that we yeah. belong in Barter Town. Yeah, <laughs> but I I had a, a I had a lot more surprises. I had a much better ride with Thunderdome. Maybe it was my expectations. Um, but yeah, I I think I'm gonna give this an eight. Yay! It's eight saxophones. Eight saxophones. What do you think, Drea? Um. Because of like when the kids get to Border Town from there forward, I would give it a seven. Okay. From there backwards, what would you give it? <laughs> yeah. uh, a four or a five. Because I was okay. just like, the pacing of this movie was just crazy. And it wasn't exciting until the kids got to Border Town causing chaos. Yep. And it's, it, I mean, so you're talking an hour into a two hour movie. So are you only reviewing a portion of the movie then? Um, the part I enjoyed, yes. Everything else, I was kind of like, hmm, these these outfits. And then I had an issue, okay, for believability for me. So Barter Town, Queen Auntie Entity is, you know, the head honcho. And I'm like, there's a lot of white people here. Mm-hmm. How is this black woman in charge? I'm like, is this what's going to happen in the future? I'm okay with that. If that's what happens because in the future. Because she's American. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. Yeah. She's happens to be black. Okay. So I was like, um, I don't see this happening realistically in the future. But, I mean, things can happen. We had a black president, so it can happen. Yeah. We'll get there. Some okay. Like we, just, <laughs> we just have to be in a po- post-apocalypse. World. Apparently. <laughs> For it to finally be a black lady's time to shine. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, she won the whitest shoulder uh, pads contest. And that's she did. It was, it was close, though, because that announcer is is, is a close outfit. second. He's a close second. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I love that assessment. I I'm, From now on, I'm only going to review the parts of the movies that I like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I agree with the eight, Nathan. We're in agreement on this one as well. I was hoping that you would go that high as well. Okay. I was a little worried that you wouldn't. Um, <laughs> but I thought this was just a madcap, funny. Mm-hmm. I was surprised. I was surprised, especially and having seen it for the first time, every turn it took, I was surprised. I was like, wait, yeah. what? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, hey. I was surprised. Were you surprised? I was surprised. I did not see that coming. <laughs> and I, I just love the little kid, the little train robber in the <laughs> plane. Like, 
uh, that's aspirational right there. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next thing we need to do is our deep cut recommendations. If you like Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, what else might you like that's sort of off the beaten path? Uh, I'll go first since I like mine. Uh, I want to yeah. recommend that you go to the Renaissance Festival and get on one of those bouncy rubber bandy things that catapults you up into the sky like they had in the mm -hmm. Thunderdome. Because okay. that's going to be your closest uh, Thunderdome experience is going to the Renaissance Festival or your local mall if you have a mall that's fallen on some hard times and has to have, uh, you know, attractions like this. But get into one of those things where they strap you into a pair of rubber bands and two teenagers pull you down and launch you into the sky. Because then I think you'll really appreciate the energy it took for Blaster mm. and Max to go flying around that arena trying to grab uh, mallets and um, pointy or non working chainsaws. What's yours, Drea? Um, what this reminded me was of was Waterworld. Oh, okay. Kevin Costner, because which is the desert, it's all water. And there's children involved and random thievery and craziness. So I would recommend Waterworld. Nice. Oh, that's perfect. Spot on. Spot on. What about you, Nathan? So the the whole uh, man with no name thing got me thinking that like if you're into if you're into those kind of stories, um, you know, like the they they even the announcer even introduces him as the man with no name, and he is kind of that archetype, like that person who breezes in to you know like a problem situation, kind of solves everything. Well. Um, the, like the classic, like man with no name with like Clint Eastwood fist full of dollars. That's actually based off of these really awesome, like Japanese films, um, Yojimbo. Um, and then there was actually a sequel called Sanjuro and the sequel Sanjuro, uh, is actually a, a little more like Thunderdome. In the fact that it, the like the grizzled samurai Toshiro Mifune has to kind of babysit all these younger samurai who have their own quest, and he's having to both like help them and like swat them down when they get too enthusiastic, and it <laughs> reminded me, and then just keeping them from getting into trouble and begrudgingly, you know, and so it was very similar. I found with um, Mad Max and all these kids. And I was really relieved yeah. when I made that connection when I was watching this movie. <laughs> but, but yeah, there, I mean, you know, like Yojimbo and Sanjiro, they're really fun adventure films. You know, mm -hmm. don't get dissuaded that, that you've got to, you know, read subtitles. They're, they're really good. Yeah, subtitles are great. Um, perfect. Well, Drea, where can people find you and support your content creating endeavors? Uh, let's see. Instagram uh, at Drea Magwood. Mostly post food, mostly omelets, and makeup looks that I'm learning this past year. And also YouTube under Andrea Magwood for makeup tutorials. Um, right now I'm in kind of a hiatus getting back to regular filmmaking. So unless you want to check out one of my older shorts, which I think is also on YouTube under True Libra LLC. Um, in Vimeo, the last responded short. Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. Come find Ooh. you for sure. I love all that stuff. Um, and Nathan, where can people find you and support your filmmaking endeavors? Uh, so yeah, Squishy Studios is probably the best and easiest way to, to check out um, any of our films or to, to basically be connected to like the all the other links for our our feature the last movie ever made so yeah that's probably the easiest direction is just squishy studios uh dot com or on youtube excellent uh and you can find me at the neighborhood comedy theater the place and at nct phoenix online or uh, you can also find me at uh, on the on True Story FM on the Cool Time Dice Hour, and you can learn more about the pod online at Instagram and Facebook at Most Excellent Pod. Thank you so much for listening, and remember when you're out there in the world crashing through a wall of cars 
in your stolen dune buggy. Uh, keep the most excellent 80s movies podcast motto in mind. Be excellent to each other, especially your helper monkey that brings you water when you're lost in the desert. Be excellent to everyone. <laughs> and party, party out, out, dudes. dudes. <laughs> Yay! Yay!